many of you know 2022 is a season for change? I believe it. But here's the thing I know about change. I sent it out to our staff this morning that where change happens, adversity shows up. It's going to happen. We, man, we were all pumped. The whole staff was pumped about coming into today and first Sunday of the year. Man, this morning, 6 o'clock, Pastor Brandon in Gainesville, his whole family is sick up there. They're throwing up, and the virus, or not, not, not the virus, I have to be careful when I say that. The bug has hit their home, and, uh, and so pray for them this morning as they're walking through that. But, man, we just knew the moment we said, God, we want you to use us and do something radical through Real Life Church like you've always done through Real Life Church, that the enemy was going to step in. It's just part, it's part of it, and we know that going into it. But we're warriored up, we're ready to go, and uh, today's going to be a little different on the front end. I'm going to walk through some stuff because maybe not all of you know Real Life Church, and this will be somewhat of an introduction to Life Connect, but I'm going to have some people help me on the platform this morning. First, I'm going to call uh, Pastor Aaron up. Pastor Aaron, if you don't know, Aaron is our location pastor here at Mountain Home. So he handles everything through that foyer, through this part of the building. Uh, he lets me preach, and, um, and he's fantastic. Aaron's been with us, what, three and a half years? Something like that, maybe a dozen, and I'm just getting old and don't remember, but he's been with us a while. Love him and his family to death. If you haven't had a chance to squeeze Blake a little bit, then you probably need to. Uh, ask permission first, just don't do it randomly, okay? And Blake's their little baby, and so, uh, so super excited to have Pastor Aaron. And then next, these people usually do about everything they can to, do stay, to stay off the platform, uh, but I'm going to have Pastor Kirby and Miss Jennifer come on up. Um, I'll, I'll share with them as they're coming. At Real Life Church, we have kind of an interesting structure. How many of you grew up in church? Hands up. So you probably had a structure similar to, you either had a senior pastor, and then as the church grew, you would, you would hire on a worship pastor slash youth pastor because everybody that knows how to sing can relate to teenagers. Or then if it grew beyond that, you would hire an associate or an assistant pastor. And that was kind of the typical structure of church for a long time and still is for a lot of churches. Um, we knew that God had called us to kind of a different mission field. Not, not that it was any less lost, but we knew God called us to do it in a little different way. And so because I'm not old, I am not the senior pastor. <laughs> I am the lead pastor at Real Life Church. Um, because we have two locations, I have two location pastors. Pastor Aaron is the location pastor here for Mountain Home. Pastor Brandon is the location pastor for our Gainesville location. And both of those churches share one vision, and that is to show real life to real people through a real Savior named Jesus Christ. We do that vision through the mission of reaching one more soul, one more family, and one more community. Everybody tracking with me? So that's what we do and how we do it. So Kirby and Jennifer, in, uh, they sit in a role, sits beneath, right directly. We, we, I meet with them daily, but they are what we call culture and direction. All of our other ministries kind of go through Kirby and Jennifer to make sure that we're staying in alignment on the right track with the vision that God has laid for our church. You'll notice we don't do a lot of things, but the things we do, we try to do extremely well. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a church that's just been super busy doing a lot of things and the gospel gets missed. I don't want us to miss the gospel. It's the most important thing that we do. And so we try to keep things very streamlined. In fact, if you were to ask most of our team and go, hey, what does real life church do? They'll go, we do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. We do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. The REACH Center is a separate entity as far as it has a vision for what it wants to do in the community. But as far as the umbrella of Real Life Church, we do Sunday mornings and we do life groups. And we do them both pretty good. And in fact, if you haven't been involved in life groups, I challenge you to do that. So Kirby and Jennifer handle culture and direction. So what I decided was I want to put them on stage and ask them questions on what they think the state of the church is in 2022. Not only the state of the church, but the state of our community and, and how we go ahead. How many of you know that Baxter County is pretty awesome? Yeah. But how many of you also know it's pretty broken? So we're just going to talk through some of that this morning. Jared, thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate what you got. You guys give it up for the worship team this morning. All that they do. 
So to answer a little bit more of the structured question, uh, if you've been here a little while, you know we don't do business meetings. Can I get an amen from somebody on that? Um, we are a pastor-led church, but I have an executive team or elders or advisory board, how, whatever terminology you want to use, it's used differently in churches all over, um, that I use for advisement and counsel. Right? I, can, I can honestly say in the 10 years that we've been here at Mountain Home and even before that, there's not been any major decision that we've walked through as a church that, that I've just kind of cowboyed it and guns ablaze and went off on my own. Uh, those decisions always come to that team and we talk through those things and I get advisement. The Bible talks about finding wise counsel and I think it's a really important thing to do. And so that's why I do that. This is part of my wise counsel right here, these, these, this group of people that are on the platform. So guys, I'm gonna jump in and dive in and, and just kind of talk through, first let's hit on the community. And if I were to ask you the question of what do you feel is the biggest hurdle facing, wait, let me clarify. In case you didn't know, this one's Jennifer and that one's Kirby. Okay, just <laughs> clarify. So, <laughs> um, but what's the biggest hurdle facing our community, Baxter County, this area? I know Pastor Brandon's walking through this in Gainesville, so let's try to keep it kind of where we are right in here. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I'll start off. I have some. Um, as far as hurdles in the community, our biggest needs in the community right now. Uh, Serving at the REACH Center, I have the opportunity or we have the opportunity to see and talk with a lot of people throughout the week uh, from our community. We also are, are partnered with several local organizations. So in that, we hear quite a bit about this. Um, and I can definitely see every day the needs in this community and why God has placed on our hearts um, and the direction of change happens here. And um, I, I've seen it daily for the last several weeks, I mean, even years, but really, since God laid that on our hearts, I've been able to say, okay, God, I see already some things that you want us to do in 2022. Um, and that's starting today. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I want to talk about is, this is the, I'm going to start off with the elephant in the room, one of the most difficult ones to talk through and talk about, but the suicide rate in Baxter County um, for the last, at least, I looked up through at least 2016, and um, Baxter County has set either first or second in, in Arkansas for the highest suicide rate. And that's not a number where, or a, a, a thing that we want to set first or second in. <laughs> that's no. not a good thing, but um, that's one thing that I feel, you know, God says change ha needs to happen here, and somehow... We need you guys to partner with us to make sure that we are looking at every avenue, everything that we can do to change that statistic to where we're not setting, I don't want to be in the top 10 in that, um, but it's going to have to start here and with you guys partnering with us on that. Let me, let me ask real quick, just, just on this topic, let's talk real quick through this topic, and I'm not going to stay long here, but how many of you right now, by show of hands, I don't want you to tell the story. I just want you to, by show of hands, how many of you personally have been impacted by suicide? Hands up. Look around. This is not how it ought to be. But also, with that, we have, how are any of us more equipped now than when we actually walked through the episode? Most of us aren't any more equipped we got through it the best we could. Maybe somebody told us to talk to somebody. So I don't know that we do a good job. I, I'll say the church. I don't know that our church does it, or any church does a good job of resourcing, addressing that need. And the community is so overwhelmed by it that they're not sure what to do either. So when we get to the church portion, I'll talk through some more of that. But go ahead. Um, and that is only getting worse the last year or two with COVID and the isolation, um, depression. So we're looking at ways, how can we make an impact and how can we change that in our community? Um, is that through the church and the REACH Center? What does that look like? Offering some more things that's available there through the REACH Center. Um, but the second thing I wanna talk about is that, you know, is a real need in the community that I see weekly is just life skills um, and partnering mm -hmm. with people to walk through with them, teach them, 
basic life skills, of course, like the REACH Center has already started out um, doing with parenting or with um, laundry, cleaning, cooking, uh, auto care, all of that. But then also there's some other things in life that we notice all the time, like on a weekly basis with um, parenting. That's one of our largest attended classes um, is parenting. How many, of you, how many of you need help parenting? <laughs> Hands up. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't, that, I mean, there are parenting classes for um, any, any parents, but also grandparents in this area. We also are dealing with a lot of grandparents raising children. Yep. Um, and if they're not raising them, they get to speak into them. So some of the, those skills are very needed in this area. But then the last thing I want to talk about in that area is um, walking with people through their marriage issues and troubles. We have seen a lot of that. And so in 2022, we want to do something about that. We want to do something about the divorce rate, whether that's in the church or just in our community. And so we're looking at several different things. How can we um, come alongside couples and walk with them through that, whether that be, I know we have some events coming up soon. Aaron, you want to walk through that real quick, just what's happening in February? Yeah, the, the first Saturday night in February. Um, who loves date night? Yeah. Who yeah, loves buddy. planning date night? Yeah. Uh-huh, that's what I thought. I do, but um, the, the first Saturday night in February, we have the opportunity to host something really fun and exciting uh, for married couples. Uh, we are going to host our first XO night. And so what XO night is going to be is we have some special friends, special guests coming in from just outside Atlanta, Pastor Carl and Julie Nichols at Relevant Church. Um, they're going to come in and they're going to be able to invest into our married couples. Um, we're going to have a great dinner to start the night. Uh, we'll have some activities during the evening, some giveaways. Uh, so it's going to be a night that is a date night, but an investment into your marriage as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be limited to the first 100 couples. So the first 100 couples that sign up, um, we look forward to hanging out with you in that. But they're going to uh, spend about an hour and just dive into marriage. What's that look like? How is it healthy? What are some of the struggles that uh, marriages are walking through? Then we're going to have a fun time. We're going to do some fun stuff together. I'm not going to tell you what those activities are going to be because I don't want you to skip out on them because you know what they're going to be. Because you're going to have to do them and they're going to be fun, I promise you. Because it's one of my <laughs> wife's favorite things we've ever done and I loved it. To be honest, I loved it. It was great. Um, and then we're also going to have in the night with a question and answer with Pastor Carl and Julie and Pastor Vince and Jennifer, who I like to call PV and J, just so you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're going to hang out with them uh, that evening. So that sign up's going to open. It'll be 40 bucks a couple. So it's hard to beat a date night for 40 bucks um, with your dinner, your activities, um, investing into your marriage. Um, so put that on your calendar for the first Saturday night in February. You'll get some more details about that coming up. But that's going to be one of our first things that we do to look into, hey, what is the, what's an impact we can make in, in our marriages, in our church, in, in our community? Um, what's something we can offer them? What's a lane? What's an avenue to give them the tools and the resources to have a healthy, Christ-centered marriage, whether they feel like they're in a healthy spot or they're in a struggling spot, um, let's all hang out together. Let's get around healthy marriages. Let's get around healthy couples. Let's, let's learn together and figure out what the next step is of, of being a, a, an example of a Christ-centered marriage, as well as walking with the other ones that are in the room that are struggling as well. So put that on your calendar for the first Saturday night in February. We're going to have our first XO night um, here at Real Life Church. I'm really excited about it. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited. Yeah, if you, uh, we'll start signups pretty quickly. Actually, I think we're going to try to get them out this week, uh, if not starting next weekend for that so that we can get that all organized. But I want to go back to something Jennifer said. She's mentioning the REACH Center. How many of you know that we have a REACH Center? Hands up, raise your hand. How many of you know what the REACH Center does? Okay. There's a difference. Uh, most people know it's the building next door, but they don't know what happens in the building next door. Um, and at some point, this is where I get to be the pastor, and sometimes the pastor is a shepherd. Um, I, I, you guys know what a shepherd's crook is? The stick? You know what that's for? It's not for walking. It's for smacking sheep. Um, that's what it's for. <laughs> this is the moment they were terrified of. Um, but sometimes we get so much in a rut in our church existence that the body in which we're a part of, we don't know what it does. 
Okay. Um, any of y'all ever had a leg or arm fall asleep while you're sitting in a chair? Yeah. And it's because it didn't get used for a little while. In regards to your church, this church, I don't want there to be pieces that fall asleep in your mind because you're going to pass somebody in Walmart, at your school, at your job, at the gas station, someplace that needs something the Reach Center does, I promise. But if we sleep on it, not the people working it, I know they're, they're invested in it, but those of us that can get the word out about it, if we sleep on it, then its effectiveness is, is cut in half. And so just if you don't know, find out. Ask, ask for a tour. It's one of the, my favorite things to do. Our favorite things to do is to walk people through and show what we're capable of doing at the REACH Center. And uh, so if you don't know, ask about it. Uh, I, want, I want to quickly, because we talked through suicide. We talked through uh, the life skills stuff. We, we had a conversation this week about with some, with some people, the young adults, that were trying to figure out taxes. And I was just blown away. Um, some of the statements that were made. And they weren't made to be funny. They were made just because they didn't know. They just didn't know what to do next, you know, and, and I don't know that we do a great job. We just kind of let people figure out life. How many of us had to just figure it out on our own? Well, the great thing about innovation and progression is that if you figure something out, pass it on so that someone else is a little further ahead than you are as they, as they come to the end of it. So um, I want to dive into the, the church, if we can, what the biggest needs of the church. And Kirby, you haven't said much down there, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into you, Kirby, for a little bit as far as what do you feel the biggest hurdle facing real-life church? Or you could probably even say the broader church. Um, I would have to say overall it's uh, quite simply people, um, people that are... Um, partnering with us in the vision and the mission of the church, um, whether that be through the REACH Center or through Sunday mornings. Um, I was looking at some statistics about this uh, earlier this week. Um, the national average for volunteering in the church is between 40 and 50 percent of the congregation that volunteers on a weekly basis at some form in the church, whether that be Sunday mornings, during the week, whatever. And currently, right now, real life churches, it sits, we're sitting around 10 percent. Um, we average around 60 to 80 volunteers a Sunday, and our attendance is around 800. So to put that in perspective, um, on a Sunday morning, kids ministry, uh, we'll see somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 kids a Sunday. Um, right now, per service, we're looking at around 10 adults that try to minister to 100 kids, if you split that in half like we are in two services. Um, so simply just doubling that number, say we had 20 people, you're taking that from one adult to 10 kids to one adult to five kids. Um, and that's just kids ministry. Every ministry across the board can use people um, that not only understand the vision and buy into the vision, but are willing to put their feet to the ground and make a difference. So. Why, why, do you think, why do you think the numbers have shifted so much in volunteering or partnering? Any of you any on this? I think there's several factors. Um, just church, big church uh, in general has done a pretty good job of trying to make it seem like we don't need help. Um, we got this. You know, we're a staff of around 10 here. Um, but then if you look at some numbers, you know, the poverty rate in our community is extremely high. We're looking at around 20,000 people that are in poverty just in the surrounding counties in Baxter County, and how can a staff of 10 church staff and 100 volunteers ever impact that? Gotcha. And I think the church has done a pretty good job of going, we're good, we're good, we don't, you know, we don't wanna bother you, we don't wanna trouble you at all, um, and we're taking away an opportunity from people in that. And I think COVID obviously had some effect on that. Um, I think we were in a, a little better shape prior to COVID as far as volunteer numbers go, but uh, um, there's just several factors. People live a busy life now. They don't, they don't think that they have time to give and they look at volunteering like, how much time is this gonna take? Well, it could be as simple as a half an hour that makes a difference. Um, you know, most volunteers on a Sunday here, we're looking at maybe an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes that we need help with. and. Uh, most of us can find time for an hour and 45 minutes a week, so. I think sometimes we need a reminder and also we forget the urgency that God has called us to and that, that we are his hands and feet. 
And I, I think a lot of times we're just like, oh, well, somebody will take care of that. Well, God has called all of us to take care of that um, and not just down the road or maybe after the pandemic. Or, no, like this is an urgent matter um, for us to jump in and be his hands and feet to reach these people and to, to help be the change in the community. Um, God has called us to be a fearless church yeah. um, and to go get it. And we can't do that sitting in this building. Yeah. So, but I think sometimes we have to have that reminder, especially coming out of a pandemic to where we're used to isolation. We're used to not being around people. Um, and that's what we've gotten used to, but that is not what God has called us to. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Aaron, what, they both keep using the word partner with us. And we use that in our Life Connect language. We say we, we're not members, but we're partners. Um, you, you taught that class before Pastor Patrick came on. Walk through that a little bit as far as that, that what we call the difference. Because, how, I mean, you all, most of you said you grew up in church. And, and most of the time, if you grew up in church, culturally, you, were a, you could have been a church member. And you went before everybody and they, yes, we'll let them in. Or no, we won't let them in. Hope that never happened to you. That's awkward. Um, but, <laughs> but you were in that kind of scenario where then... Hey, we have the electric bill. Do we want to pay it? Aye. You know, we, hey, we want to build a building. Do we want to build it? Aye. What's the difference, the main difference? I don't know why you don't have a lot of time because I'm going to preach and I'm not letting you off without me preaching. Um, what's the main difference in that? Well, um, I'll try not to preach. But uh, I want to piggyback that question real quick, though, before I get into that one. I think a big reason volunteer numbers hurt so much is because there's a lie that's been told whether it's told to yourself or between isolation or someone in your past or just someone in general or the, or the enemy has told you that you can't make a difference. Mm -hmm. That you can't do anything that's substantial to see impact take place. And we forget the people that were in our lives in kids' ministry, in greeting, and, and, and in Sunday school, or, or whatever it was that made a difference in our life. And now we have the opportunity to do the same thing. In, in our rally pre-service this morning, um, if you serve in one of the serve teams that takes place uh, throughout the day or on the first serve, um, we rally about 45 minutes before. And, and I was telling our team, you can't experience real unless you are real. You can't experience life change unless it starts with you first. Otherwise, it's all fake. And I think we, we neglect the fact that there's been people that have invested in us and now it's our opportunity and it's our chance to be real and to walk in the confidence of who God's created us to be and obey in what he said of, hey, take this step and watch me do what I will do and what I can do, but I just need you to take the step. And maybe that's, that's partnership. And what we, we use the term partnership here at Real Life Church rather than membership because coming out of church cultures and where everything gets muddy and gets twisted and gets confusing is that membership too often means that you have a right. But partnership means that we all have a responsibility. And we all have a responsibility to call out and go out and be the hands and feet and deliver the gospel to those around us. There are going to be people that you're sitting next to, in the seats next to you, the, in your cubicle next to you, um, as, as you're going through your daily life, your family members that I won't ever have the opportunity to reach. Mm -hmm. But by coming alongside you, then we're all carrying out our responsibility. We sat a lot last year on the Great Commission. And being a church that in the Great Commission, you don't get to pick to be a church that's a church about discipleship or evangelism. The Great Commission is both. Yep. There's not an option of picking one or the other. We have to do both. And when it comes to, to partnership, we want to partner with every single person to give the avenues, to give the lanes, to give you the confidence and tools and ability that go out and tell the people about who Jesus is. I told our interns a few weeks back uh, and our staff when we were going through something that you cannot reach people without people. You can't reach people without people because you, your pool is so tight then because you're by yourself. And when you're trying to reach people by yourself, that's isolation. 
And the enemy's greatest tool is isolation. Because he can put you by yourself and the only thing you begin to hear are the lies and the things that he begins to tell you because you have nobody else speaking into you saying, hey, we're, we're reaching these people. Hey, this impact is being made. Hey, these people just moved from Texas because they were watching the six o'clock sermon that was being posted and now they want to be a part of a real life church. Those things are being missed because you, in order to reach people, you have to have people. And people are the greatest commodity that God has trusted us with as well. Mm -hmm. They're also one of the hardest things to work with that God has trusted us with. But they're the most beautiful thing that he's created because every single one of us are created in his image out of the substance of who he is. And every single person is placed on his heart and created for a purpose for us to go and to reach, to downsize hell and to grow his kingdom. And it's our responsibility to go and get them. I, one of my greatest hearts, and I believe it's one of the greatest hearts of this team right here, is if you dive into Matthew 25, and in the parable of the talents, and the, the, the leader has gave them each an opportunity to go out and to grow and to invest. And the first two comes back, and he looks at them and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. If as a, as a lead to leadership team, as an organization, as a church, if we are not giving people opportunities for you to come face to face at one point with Jesus and for him to look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, then we failed. Mm -hmm. Serving is an opportunity for you to, to connect with people. The person that walks through the door and you begin to look at them and you say, God, show me the people, show me their brokenness, show me them how you see me. And you begin to see their brokenness, but in their brokenness, you see their completeness and their wholeness because that's who God's created them to be. And they're walking in the door searching for that. And he's placing it on some of your hearts to say, hey, I need to walk alongside you. One of my favorite things that takes place is one, a person on our, our experience hosting, Brandon Belcher. One of the things he's intentional about every single Sunday is learning names because it matters and it's important. That people walk through the doors, and when you walk through the second time to remember, hey, how's it going, Chris? I'm so glad. How, how was that going throughout the week? You have a responsibility to walk in the confidence and obedience of what God has laid on your heart to go and reach people. But reaching people is hard because we've so been told lies so many times of whether it's, hey, you missed that opportunity or you didn't take that opportunity, so why are they going to listen to you now? The only thing we can do when it comes to following Jesus is obedience. Well, now I'm going to preach. Um, so I want you guys to do me a favor. I want you to give it up for this team because I can't do. I pray, I pray you understand what all of them said is a reflection of what happens on a Sunday morning. I don't get to do this. This, this, this may come as a surprise and don't please think it's, I'm being flippant. This is the easiest thing I do all week long, preaching. I, I, it is part of who I am. I don't know how to not do it. Uh, I had seasons where I tried to not do it. And um, it's, I'll give you the verse here in just a second because I think it's very fitting in where I've been with this whole change happens here idea for the 22. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9 says this, I'm a... I'm going to move these in, and I'm going to use this as the world's largest pulpit. Right here. Now you all intimidated, right? <laughs> Jeremiah 20, verse 9 says, I say, this is Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet of God who is known as the lamenting or the weeping prophet because these prophecies that God gave him were heavy to share with the people. And so it got to a point where Jeremiah said, I'm just not going to tell anybody. I can't do this to these people, God. I can't share this with these people. And this is, the, this is the weight of the burden that God laid on Jeremiah. He says, I won't mention him or speak any longer in his name. Catch this. But his message becomes a fire burning in my heart as if it's shut up in my bones and I become tired of holding it in. I cannot prevail. This gospel of Jesus Christ, this thing that Jesus has done in you ought to feel like that. And let's just be honest, church. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. Sometimes it's just good to be at church. Sometimes it's just, we came, we did some songs, Pastor Vince made us laugh, gave her offering, we rolled out, hits chilies. I said the chilies. 
And it's not as if this thing that will change someone's eternity is really, is really paramount to us. It's, it's a thing we do. It's, it's, and it's an extension of who we are, not the reason that we are. Does that make sense? Is anybody with me on that or is it just your pastor? That sometimes I feel like that. That sometimes I just, I, I know how to be a Christian. I know how to go through the motions. But the reality that some of you have kids or spouses or parents that do not know Jesus and they will go to hell unless the gospel gets in their way. It's a requirement that change happens here. And I'm not just talking about in this building on this corner of Mountain Home. I'm talking about in our community that's radically broken, that needs Jesus Christ. Because he's the only thing that heals. And so I want to talk through everything that they mentioned, the need for people serving, the need for brokenness in our community. Some of the, some of the suicide rates that are there are pretty incredible. And, and when you start looking at that, it's painful, especially if you've walked through it. And I don't mean to flesh up any old wounds for you, but in reality, if you have those old wounds and they boil back from time to time, it means you haven't talked through them in a healthy way. This year, we want to provide a healthy way to do that. We have an issue with homeliness, homelessness, homeliness in our community. <laughs> well, uh, <sighs> homelessness in our community. Enunciation, Vince, enunciation. That's, that's so much bigger than anyone realizes. I, I guarantee you, it's so much bigger than you realize. In fact, there's a reality that there may be people in this service right now who do not have residents, and most likely will be in the next service, that do not have residents. They don't have shelter consistently. They don't have heat, and it was cold this morning. And so the reason this mentality, the reason these things happen is when the church ceases being the church and becomes something different. And we all do this. I grew up doing this. I grew up kind of treating church as if it's the thing that I do, but it's the thing that I do in order to receive. Like, I, I don't know how many of you have ever done church like this. You get up in the morning, you go to church, and then after church, it was like, worship was a little loud today. Sermon was okay. Did you see so-and-so at the front door? A little snotty today. Anybody ever done that in any church? I know you'd never say that about real life, but any other church you've ever said that about? Anybody with me on that? Like, we have this idea, man, church service was good. Worship was good. They were on top of it. They were killing it. Man, Becca opened it up. The back wall started rattling. It was awesome. We love that. Jared's over there playing every instrument on the stage. Woo! And literally he can, and it's so frustrating. But such a blessing also. It was good. And we sit here going, it's good. It's a good job. Good job. Whew, I feel like I've been to church. And we leave. And yet, how many of you have a Bible at home? Say amen. In that Bible, at no point in any part of scripture is the attending of a worship gathering intended for you to receive. I checked. I was digging around. Unless you're lost. Unless you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. In fact, from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, we hear Paul talk about it. You get the word offering. Now, before you freak out, I'm not talking about the bucket at the end of your row. Because that's not at all what it was talking about. The entirety was, we, here's the illustration. If I had a bucket in my hand, it would be as if we come to church with an empty bucket going, 
Man, that was a good worship song. Man, that was my favorite worship song. Hey, somebody high-fived me at the front door. The coffee was cold today, so we're going to take that out. And then, man, Pastor Vince, it was a good sermon, but I don't know if I really got anything out of it. I remember that one story about his five-year-old daughter who sings rock songs, but I don't know what kind of spiritual stuff I got. But it was good, and so we put it in the bucket, and we leave with the bucket going, it's full or it's half full or it's empty, and we go, depending on what's in the bucket, that's what determine whether I had a good Sunday or not. Yet the biblical perspective of worship gatherings would have been starting on Monday. Man, I woke up today and I got air in my lungs and I'm going to put that in the bucket. My wife and my children are healthy and I'm going to put that in the bucket. God, you've given me the ability to work and to provide for my family. So guess what? I'm going to put this in the bucket. You give me the ability to use my gifts and talents. And so God, I'm going to put that in the bucket. God, these people that you've surrounded me with, these friends, this family, these neighbors, these coworkers, these students that are alongside me, you've given this all to me and I'm going to put it in the bucket. And then we come to church together and we take the bucket bucket and we pour it out. That's how this is supposed to function. When that starts happening in a community, you talk about radical change, they won't know what's happening up here on the hill on Rossi Road. They won't know how to explain it because it won't come from a platform. It'll come from an office desk. Or it'll come from underneath a car in a mechanic shop. It'll come from a school. It'll come from some sort of place in the community because we've said, no, 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 I'm filling my bucket out here because of what God's done in me. But boy, you ought to get there when we all celebrate dumping our buckets out. You ought to be there when, when there's 300 of us, 500 of us, 800 of us pouring our bucket out in praise to what God has done in our life and what God has given us in our life. You see, I sat uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when we sat in that, that kitchen in Batesville, Arkansas, me and Jennifer staring at each other, both of us just trying to figure out what was wrong in the church. And I'd already pastored eight years. I still didn't know what was wrong with the church. It just didn't feel real. How are you? I'm fine. Really? No, my wife left, my kids are on drugs, and I just lost my job, but I'm okay. And their eye would twitch a little bit. You guys know what I'm talking about? Gosh, to be vulnerable and authentic to go, this week sucked. And I need somebody to pray with me. I'm going to lose my stuff. We could just all be honest. How many of you have had a few weeks like that the last year? I just need somebody that I can go, I don't know what to do. See, that's where we pour the bucket out with each other. Scripture in Deuteronomy, I was looking at it, it was was God actually laying down the law about how you came to worship, how you come to worship come to worship and this and he was laying out the different festivals of the tents and the different festivals of the bread and the, and the offerings and different things like that and you get to the end of Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 16 and 17 and I'm just going to give this to you and I, I think we got this one up on the screen but it's it's a pretty powerful statement they shall not appear before the Lord empty handed every man every man shall give as he is able. According to what? According to the blessing that the Lord, your God, he has bestowed upon you. We don't come to church with an empty bucket. We come with a full bucket. You say, Vince, well, here's the deal. If you come expecting to fill your bucket at church, then here's the thing. You're going, well, Vince, if I put all this stuff and I bring it to God, isn't that me just trying to prove my worth as a Christian? No. It's just you're returning how much worth God has put in you. And if you study the word worship, the word worth comes into play. He is worth all of it. He is worth all of it. I'm going to get ready to close here in just a second. So I'm going to go ahead and dismiss Kirby and Jennifer. They're going to step out. Yeah, I'm already late, but I'm going to take a few minutes. Y'all good with that? So yesterday, 
I got a call uh, from the mayor, and he said, if you know Hillary, <laughs> he said, is this Vince? Yep. And I said, um, we started talking through text message a little bit about the situation that was going on. He said, I'm starting to get calls. We're starting to see people load up in Casey's and different stores. And uh, he said, I, I don't know anyone else that's doing anything. Is real life going to help? See, now there's one part of me, there's a human part of me that goes, of all the people to call, why are you calling us? Luckily, that's a really small part of me. Because there's a God part of me that goes, 13 years ago, when we said, God, we want to birth a church that when trouble comes or when trial happens, they don't go to the hospital. They don't go to the police. They don't go to these different things when struggles happen. They go to where those answers are. They go to the church. You see, that's what it used to be back in the early days of the church when Paul's talking about the start of the church. All orphanages came out of the church. All hospitals came out of the church. All higher education started in the body of the church because the gospel was at the center of it all. And so yesterday we got that call and we said, you know what, yeah, heck yeah, we'll do something. I said, what's the issue? And they said, it's going to be 12 degrees tomorrow night. We have no place for people to go. No place for people to go. Or there's no place willing to open up for them to go. And I go, and in my mind, I'm thinking, man, this is one of those hypocrite moments where I could say, I don't know if we got the room. Or I can go, I tell my people every week to be the hands and feet of Jesus. God forbid we miss an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So this afternoon, they're going to deliver cots to the Reed Center. And we're going to open up an emergency shelter like we did last February during the snowstorm. And we're going to provide a warm place for people to sleep. We're going to provide them some food so they can eat. We're going to provide them safety. And maybe, just maybe, one of them, Patrick, will let their guard down enough into a warm bowl of whatever to share Jesus. My challenge to you today is please don't go through this week and this be all you experience of Jesus. I sent Kirby and Jennifer to the Life Connect room because if you want to help this week with that outreach, if you want to help us change our community, one cot, one person at a time, then they want to hear from you. They want to know how you can help. Don't assume, let me just, let me help you with this because I think Aaron is correct. Don't assume anything. Whatever you can offer, let no man come to the house of God empty-handed, but bringing that, let every man bring that which God has blessed him with. Whatever, if, if it's time, if it's opportunity, if it's food, if it's whatever it is, God can use you in someone else's story. There was a deacon back in the hills of Kentucky. His name was Ernie. And this little deacon, um, he would just basically get happy every church service. Um, it, how many of you know what I mean by get happy? Some of you don't have that church context in your background. But when, when I was younger, if you were in church and somebody got happy, it meant somebody was going, woo! And boy, it'd get good. And they'd, get, they'd do it in the middle of a song or right in the middle of a sermon. Boy, you'd be preaching. Somebody would go, woo! And I'd nearly fall off the stage. I'd be up there singing with my mom and dad, my little microphone shaking. Somebody would shout or get happy, and I'd lose it. I'd just start crying. I was terrified. I have PTSD from it, so don't do it. Um, sorry, I just messed up your flow there. You were really in something good. they get happy. You have the opportunity to literally be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. 
Say, Vince, I can't be here. We want to give. You can give. You can give online. You can do what we normally do. That's fine. But maybe for some of you, maybe for some of you, you said, you know what? This part, see, I, I can, I, just like me preaching, guys, I could do this every day of the week, six hours a day. It's easy for me. It's, I love to do it. This part's easy. The 10 to 3 a.m. shift on Monday night, that's the tough part. 